reading is the amplifier 30 here yet again uh, no the Astro 30 here yet again I've got a kind of interesting one for you I've got sitting on the desk here an Australian monitor installation series AMIS 120 4 channel mixer public address amplifier now these sort of amplifiers were used in um, shopping centers uh, like grocery stores and stuff so you have the music going through the store plus their advertising junk so, example Woolworths, Coles, Reject Shop, Shiploads um, plus the ability for the uh, staff to use microphones to tell other staff members in the store to you know uh, can I have a staff member to the service desk please or you've got a call parked on line one that sort of stuff and th this would be what would be at the heart of all that one of these amplifiers um, there are other different brands out there like uh, TOA which is a very common um, public address amplifier to use in shopping centers too and we'll take a look at the features on the rear panel in just a second but here on the front we've got four mixer level controls we've got the base treble and master controls a series of switches here plus the power switch which for Australia is upside down by the way that might do my OCD I might end up rotating that switch around yet I'm not sure and these switches here switch various different speaker connections at the back there now this thing weighs a ton but this is a look at the back panel. Over here is your various uh, speaker outputs. You've got your 8 ohm and your 4 ohm connections here plus the ground. Um, you've got the line output section near the 70 volt or 100 volt. Uh, so the 100 volt line you can drive those speakers that have the transformer mounted at the speaker driver. Like the ones that are mounted in the ceiling of the shopping center and you can have i'm not sure if there's a limitation of how many you can actually connect to that maybe someone can shed some light but as far as i know one amplifier on the 100 volt line can drive several um, of those speakers without affecting the impedance at the amplifier end you've also got some other uh, outputs here for the inbuilt oscillator you've got the chime the alert sound the bell sound and an evac sound and down under here is where all those switched outputs from the switches at the front are controlled so that's your speaker zone so you've got one two three four five six here we've got a 24 volt dc output that's connected to nothing box relay out common normally closed normally open um, that can be used to control something else separately a VCA output now that from reading the service manual is so that a 500k potentiometer can be connected across these this this these two points here to control the master volume remotely um, you would set the master volume control on the front panel uh, to a certain level and this point pot across here would be used to attenuate it so it can be lowered but it cannot be increased past the master volume setting we've also got a phantom power on off switch here which gives 15 volts here to the uh, other XLR sockets which there's some off screen here for each of the uh, four inputs you've also got a balanced line out or a tape out and here's each of the four input channels uh, you can use a line input here if you want on these XLR jacks but you have to have the phantom power off or you can use microphones uh, and you've also got uh, RCA input so you connect your stereo source left and right to here and obviously inside the amplifier it would down mix that stereo signal to mono because it's only a mono amplifier and you've got your voltage selection switch here for well you can only change between 240 and 230 not 110 but whatever and a fused IEC power socket over the other side there's this six and a half millimeter phono jack which is known as insert and if you use a like stereo um, plug with this one side's the preamps out which I believe is the tip 
the ring is the power amplifier's input. So you can basically insert um, another mixed signal between the two into the power amplifier, or you could just bypass the uh, mixer preamplifier circuitry and um, ooh, and uh, supply another signal directly to uh, the power amplifier. And I believe this is wired after the master control, so yeah, it would probably come full blasting out if you're not careful. So that's a look at the back panel. Now, why have I got this? Well, I was down at the South Hobart tip shop yesterday and I saw it sitting there, 20 bucks, and apparently works at time of testing, <laughs> which is not really that helpful to anyone. The case is a bit scratched and beat up. There's a nasty scratch on the front panel here. So I grabbed hold of it because I thought it was interesting. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick look at the schematic. Well, mainly for the power amplifier section of this thing, I'm not going to show the mixer preamp thing. The service manual for this is the AMIS60-120, and that's fairly downloadable off the internet anyway. But I'm only going to show the power amplifier um, schematic because I found it kind of an interesting design. So we're looking at the schematic now for the power amplifier section and this is the only one we're going to be looking at because the rest of it there's just way too much to go through and it's kind of not really relevant it's just a bunch of op amps configured as a mixer before it. What is interesting about this power amp however is it's running on a single-ended supply so you've got positive 35 volts coming in on this rail and this rail here is earthed or is connected to negative. The other interesting fact is we've got a positive input and a negative input. So that means we've got a non-inverted input coming in here on this side and on this side we've got a 180 degrees phase shifted input coming on this one. Why? Well up here is one whole entire amplifier. It's not your conventional push-pull uh, class AB amplifier that you would normally see. It's non-conventional. And down here is a direct duplicate of what was above. So looking at just the top one, the non-inverting input comes in here and goes through this op amp here. Now it features local feedback via this one mega ohm resistor. And it also features global fe feedback from the output via this 10K resistor. And if we do the math, the 10K resistor here and the 1K resistor here gives this amplifier section up here a gain of 11. So why are they doing this? Well, one amplifier, this one, the output comes here at connector X1, pin 10. The output of the second amplifier comes on the same connector X1, but at pin 9. Between those two points is your output transformer. So one end of the output transformer is connected to pin 10 of X1 and the other end of the uh, output transformer is connected to X1 at pin 9. Not that it's actually shown on the schematic or anywhere referenced in the service manual, if you want to call it that. And I'm going to assume for all intents and purposes, because I haven't really looked, the center tap, it should be a center tapped primary of that transformer would be going to this negative rail over here. So that turns these two separate amplifier stages into a push-pull amplifier through that output transformer. And that's why one um, side is inverted and the other side is not. And a lot of amplifiers back in the day using output transformers had a similar topology where a transistor would drive one side of the transformer the other transistor would drive the other side of the transformer and the center tap of the transformer was grounded. And this is what I was talking about with a push-pull amplifier using an output transformer. One transistor drives one side of the transformer, the other transistor drives the other side. The center tap usually goes to ground, sometimes, not always. Um, and then the output then is connected from the transformer to the speaker and you drive your bases however you want to do so. So now that we've briefly looked at the schematic, I'm not going to plug this in and turn it on. Oh no, I'm going to take it apart. Now I've already taken the four screws on the top off, uh, but in order to get the 
cover off this bracket for the rack mount um, has to come off plus these two screws over here so there's three screws here and two over there um, I'm not sure how much one of these amplifiers was worth back in the day that was quite loose um, I'm gonna go on a limb here and say probably close to the uh, thousand two thousand dollar mark maybe and that was loud but the good thing about this thing is it's Australian it's none of this Chinese rubbish and you can see how long that bracket's been on there because of the dust mark so I'll now take out these other two screws and I'll do the same procedure on the other side and there's no screws on the back or anything so that should be all I have to take out all right uh, all the screws are out now so this should just lift off I'm hoping uh -huh. and we're in like Flynn oh it's dusty in there So there's a good look at uh, power amplifier board and a heat sink which is covered in dust and something I didn't notice before it does actually have a uh, fan so this is a fan forced heat sink which is nice the input board at the back here covered in a thick layer of dust wow man that's pretty dusty I guess it's not the worst I've seen here is the power transformer, the mains transformer, and down here is what looks similar. That's our output transformer. Look at the size of it. And that output transformer is connected to this connector here, which is the X1 connection that I was talking about before. Um, so pin 9 or connection point 9 goes to one side of this transformer over here and number 10 goes to the other side but it's really really hard to see from here uh, you know what connects to what uh, assuming that's pin 1 so 1 2 3 4 6 7 8 9 so 9 and 10 the black and that blue wire there go well the blue wire goes to there I can't see where the black wire goes maybe I've got something wrong it's not really relevant how that's wired the annoying thing about the service manual is it doesn't actually show you the wiring to this transformer so you're kind of left blind and it also doesn't show you how to take the uh, unit apart and judging by what I can see it doesn't look to be uh, any way that the rear panel or bottom panel I should say comes off. At the front here is the mixer preamplifier board with all of its input pots and base treble and the master and as you can see they're all single gain pots um, so it's not stereo. So that's a good look at the inside of the amplifier it's not really that exciting but um, it is pretty well crammed in there but it's a nice beefy output transformer and a nice beefy power transformer the thing is this transformer only uh, gives a total DC voltage of around 35 volt which I found kind of a small voltage but uh, when I test this um, shortly I'll be actually testing what its power output is um, across the 8 ohm connection anyway and, and we'll get a good look at uh, you know how much power this thing can actually produce but um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this outside and I'm going to dust it out <coughs> don't breathe it in Alright, I've got it uh, dusted out as 
best as possible and cough my lungs up in the process. An air compressor or a uh, compressed can of air would probably be a better idea in this um, case, but I don't actually have that sort of stuff at the moment. And if anyone's wondering why my room looks uh, different laid out wise, it's uh, because I've had to move again. Uh, because the owner of the rental property I was in before uh, was not renewing the lease for next year. So uh, my housemates and I had to up camp and pitch our tent here. Anyway, that's beside the point. I've got the amplifier uh, connected to the dim bulb. And I'm going to do a first preliminary power on test just to make sure there's nothing unusual going on. So I'll turn the bulb on nothing happened and I will turn the main switch on right okay there's a bit of current draw on the dim bulb but nothing really significant so that looks to me like it's all right so I'll turn it off for now so I guess the next thing to do would be to hook it up to an oscilloscope and a signal generator and see if we've got an output. So in order to do that I need to get to this uh, output terminal strip. So I'm going to take this plastic protective cover off so I can get to the screws here. Currently when they've removed it from the installation they've just cut the wires that connected to the speakers. Um, so in order for me to test this properly I'm going to have to remove those wires and I might just stick a couple of, um, actually, you know what? I'm hoping I could just remove the insulation like that off of the wires. That'd probably be easier. All right, I've got the dummy load set up, the oscilloscope set up. I'm using my little oscillator and I've got the ground connected to the center pin of the XLR socket next to the RCA socket and this uh, hot lead from the uh, oscillator basically bodged into the RCA connector. I can actually go ahead and uh, you know grab my RCA socket that I've got lying around but yeah well I'm lazy. Um, I've got channel 1's input control to around about position 2 and the master about the same so we should see some form of output hopefully once I turn the unit on currently I do not see anything which is kind of disappointing so I crank the master up I still don't see anything still nothing so okay either I'm not getting a signal or it's just not outputting anything um, all right I might actually go with the RCA uh, socket to get the input directly into the RCA I might actually have it connected wrong or something I'm not sure uh, but nothing is coming out currently, so that's kind of annoying. Well, I've found the output from the mixer preamplifier to the input of the power amplifier on both the negative and positive going inputs. However, I've got all the controls cranked and I'm on times 10 because there is actually DC present on these connections. Um, so it just goes off the scope. Um, so I'm getting a signal to the input, but there's nothing coming out, which is kind of depressing. Budkus, nothing. F*** all. Uh, right, so let me just play with some switches here. Nothing seems to be doing anything. That is kind of annoying too. Master is cranked, channel 1 is cranked, there is no signal there, nothing. So I don't know what exactly is going on here, but yeah, there is no, no output. Oh, Ooh. 
Okay, I'm such an idiot sometimes. I've been studying the schematic for the last 10-20 oh, minutes. And there's an X2 connector here, which should be uh, 24 volt DC. That operates this relay, which there's a little uh, transistor and delay circuitry to turn this relay on. This relay was not coming on. There's two block bridge rectifiers mounted to the chassis here. This is the main one where you can't quite see it. And there's a second one over here. The 24 volt DC comes off of uh, that to drive the relay circuitry. And it also connects to the back panel at the rear there uh, to the 24 volt DC output. The power transformer has two secondaries between each red and black wire of 27 volt. When I measured across the secondaries before, I was only getting 15. Then the same at the main rectifier here, I was only getting around 16 volt DC. There should have been 35. I'm like, what's going on? Well, the reason is simple. The dim bulb was uh, glowing quite bright, or at least half its brightness. It was limiting the current. So there was probably only like 120 volt AC coming into this transformer, which is not enough for the rest of the uh, circuitry to operate correctly. Um, now when I turn it on, huh, look at that, we've got an output. Isn't that special? So yeah, silly me, I should have realised that, um, that's the wrong one, I should have realised that, yeah, I was doing something wrong. But we've got a nice clean output so far on the scope. Um, it's in times 10, so it's saying... 205 millivolt, which is not a lot, so I'll drop the volts per division right down and I'll up the master. There we go. Well, it's not even going clipping yet. Uh, drop the holy hell. Alright, the clipping's there, we're getting 90.5 volt at the output. Okay, so we got roughly 90 volt peak to peak, so we need to divide that by 2, so that's 45. So 45 multiplied by itself is that, divided by the current load, which is 8 ohms, that is 250 watts peak into 8 ohms. So I didn't actually catch what the VRMS was. Uh, 31.5. I mean, I probably could have calculated it, but anyway, 31.5 multiplied by itself equals that divided by the load. So about 120 watts RMS is what it's pushing out into 8 ohms, which is quite significant. So I thought this was going to turn into a repair video where I'd have to, like, fault find the bloody thing, but no, apparently I don't. Um, it seems to be working fine. Although, well, you can't see any output on the scope because of my voltage per division. There we go. Uh, so, yeah, it is working. Currently, it's pushing... Uh, that's 800 millivolts, so that's, what, 8 volts, something like that. Um, which is perfectly fine. But I have noticed that the fan doesn't actually come on yet so I reckon there's a temperature sense um, circuitry here as well that I reckon once this starts heating up the fan will come on well at least that's the theory uh, I really have to start dumping some uh, current into the into the load and uh, see at what point the fan operates. This needs to start getting hot, but it's not really doing anything right now. Right, it's been running for about five minutes. The fan still doesn't come on, but that heat sink is starting to get pretty hot. Um, I wish I had a thermal uh, uh, thermometer or something here that I could, uh, you know, actually see how hot it really is getting. Um, anyway, the reason why that relay is important is because, well, it does provide a little bit of uh, turn on the thump, uh, and it's actually also switching the common outputs here at the back. So if the relay's not on, well, there's going to be no connection at the back, is there? So, yeah, that was my 
own little mishap there for the day, brain fart. I should have figured it out that the voltage was just being limited um, by the bulb too much. Uh, it probably means that the bulb that I was using to test this amplifier on is uh, probably too high of a wattage and it's limiting the current too much. It probably needs to be a lower wattage bulb. Um, I've got the equivalent of about a 100 watt bulb, I think it is. It probably needs to be more like 40. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there. All the bulb was there for was just to, you know, protect my mains infrastructure in case there was a major short circuit fault or something. It doesn't appear to be. But what I want to do now is I really want to do a frequency response test on this. Alright, so I'm going to adjust my level on the amplifier. So I'm getting in between these two graph points here so we can see that the voltage is remaining the same. So according to that, it's about the 195 millivolt mark and we're at 1 kilohertz. And I'll select about 40 hertz. Yes, we can see the signal, but it's really starting to ramp down. Uh, so let's try 20 hertz. Yeah, 10 hertz. We can't even see anything. 20 hertz. It's it's really low in voltage. Uh, so it's rolling off. So I'm going to go to 100 hertz now. And there we have it there. Uh, so at 200 hertz the voltage has come back up. So where are we starting to roll off is the question. So I'll change it to 50, 150, 150 seems fine, 140, 130, yeah, I'm going to say it starts rolling off at 140 hertz, okay, so that's fine, we zero that out, I will now go to I heard a relay click in the unit for some reason. 500 hertz. Voltage is still nice and strong and the same. Uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're up to 1900 hertz now. Uh, what am I doing? I want to go to 2 kilohertz. So. Um, so 2000 hertz, it's fine. 4000 hertz, it's fine. 5000, 6000, still relatively flat. I can still hear clicking going on in the amplifier, but I'm not sure what is actually happening. Uh, so, wrong way. Yeah, we're starting to fall off a bit. We're at 11 kilohertz, 12 kilohertz, and it's, it's starting to roll off. Uh, yeah, so it starts rolling off at... Around 8... 8 kilohertz roughly. Okay, um, that seems fine I suppose. I think there's another click. I'm not sure what's going on in there. There is a relay down here but I don't know what it does offhand. I've got to be careful there's AC running there. So that heat sink is getting considerably hot. It hasn't cooled down. Alright, I've got the thing hooked up to a speaker now. So I've got the volumes down relatively low. So. I will turn it on. Ooh. So apart from it sounding a little bit on the harsh side, it uh, is functioning as an amplifier. 
So I'll just go back into the generator. Yeah, that's pretty noisy, isn't it? I don't know if that's the the uh, the generator itself. doing that or whether it's um, the amplifier because that does sound a bit distorted even though on the uh, oscilloscope screen it looks fine so I'll turn that off for now I'm going to hook up a proper music source off my laptop I guess wherever I've put that now and uh, see if uh, the sound sounds alright I found the laptop so I'll disconnect the, um, the oscilloscopes generator and I'll hook up my test lead to the input socket and I'll hook this uh, end up to my laptop. Oh man, it stunk! Alright, so I don't want to actually electrocute myself so I'll just put that there like that. Hopefully this is not going to interfere with anything. All right, I've got that set up. There is a hum coming out the speaker. relay that I was pointing to before um, is clicking away for whatever reason with the music. I'm not sure what its actual function is. It's uh, RY1. So I might have a quick look at the uh, schematic of uh, the original download I've got of for that preamp and see what its function is. Yeah, well, there it is there in the center of the screen. That's RY1, which is a 24 volt relay. That's the one clicking in and out. And it comes off of IC5. Um, it looks to do with something, uh, even though these contacts don't appear to be wide anywhere, uh, it looks like to me that it's something to do with the Vox uh, muting circuitry because there's the jumper connector there if I just carefully unplug this connector there's the jumper there because it's right near where the relay is which is just over here out of shot that's the Vox relay enabled so if that was actually not enabled that relay would not be clicking in and out however the unit appears to be working fine so I'm going to probably put it back together and leave it alone now I'm not going to touch anything else and just checking the service manual here it says the box muting feature it's uh, to automatically mute channels 3 and 4 when a signal is applied to either channels 1 or 2 it is normally used so that a paging micro microphone can have priority by muting over background music. So in other words what this relay is doing is it's waiting for uh, speech to come through from a microphone on channels 1 or 2 and if the audio source for the music was actually on channels 3 or 4 then it would automatically mute out that particular those two channels so that uh, you know you could go clean up dial 3, aisle 3 and then the microphone would cut out and then the music would come back. That's it's primary function. So that's the reason why it was clicking in and out is because it's detecting well enough audio signal from channel 1 there to activate it. So 
really I shouldn't have had the audio source on channel one. So with that being said, I'm going to leave this video here and I hope you enjoyed it, even though I made a little bit of an error before with uh, when I was running it on the dim bulb and thought it had a fault when it actually didn't. Anyway, that's fine. We all make mistakes. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please remember to rate, comment and subscribe below if you haven't done so already. And I shall see you guys in the next one. And this is the Astro 30 saying, see ya. Have a great day. That's all the time we have now. Now, make sure you tune in next week. Or f*** you, you f***ing damn asshole.